I'm doing well. Yourself? I'm doing excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much for uh, for speaking with me, and, and congratulations. Uh, here, you're, uh, you're, you're, you and your family are expecting in another couple months. Yes, thank you. I'm very excited about it. I uh, love being a father. I, I put it off for too long, but I'm <laughs> trying to make up for lost time. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> Uh, but at any rate, thank, thanks so much for, for agreeing to speak uh, to me and, and uh, the American Public Health Association. Obviously, this is, this is an important, important month for us, uh, just prevention in general. And uh, uh, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month uh, is really addressing just an, uh, a, you know, a critical issue in the fact that suicide is the leading cause of violent death in the U.S., and uh, and we know how active you've been in its promotion. So, uh, from your perspective, what makes this specific health observance so important to you? Well, not only was I the uh, author and sponsor of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which is designed to eliminate the discrimination against those like myself who uh, seek mental health services, uh, as I am someone who is a consumer of mental health services, someone in recovery from both bipolar and addiction. But we need to do this because it affects every American family in some regard or another. And uh, when you consider the statistics, uh, 38,000 Americans successfully take their lives every year. It's an epidemic. And when you consider that 18 of our nation's heroes, our veterans, are taking their lives every day, and when you think that 90% of those who take their lives are suffering from uh, underlying a mental illness, then you know that if we were to better treat the underlying mental illness, we would have a very good chance at reducing the overall suicide rate. So um, we definitely need to take this uh, uh, much more seriously and with a greater sense of urgency. I'm proud that uh, during health care reform that we're seeing now underway, mental health is considered an essential health benefit. And my hope is that mental health will be treated in the same way in the sense of screenings. So everybody is familiar with getting their blood pressure checked and their cholesterol checked. I'm hoping that a checkup from the neck up essentially will be as routine as every other kind of checkup you get when you see your physician. Whether it's your pediatrician or your geriatrician, if it's a woman's health issue or what have, whatever it is, we all need mental health to better complement our overall physical health. And, uh, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to carry this message forward because the tragedies of our not addressing mental health as part of routine care is really this epidemic of suicide. Um, and I, I would just underscore again, a lot of this can be, I think, prevented uh, if we took a, a much more comprehensive view that um, you know, mental health is integral to overall uh, wellness and well-being. And, and some of those statistics are just staggering, and I think it's, it's important that we have some of our, our nation's leaders actually speak about their own uh, personal and private struggles, and, and you've been very open um, with yours, uh, and, and, you know, and you were a congressman for 16 years, and, and yet you're still, um, you're still open about uh, your drug abuse and, and depression issues, so you know how difficult it can be to turn it around. Uh, so I guess what gives you hope that others in, in the future uh, battling similar struggles can meet with, with similar success? Well, I see the promise of recovery and the success of treatment every day because I am uh, part of my recovery is to fo focus on my illness as a as a day-to-day -day matter. Frankly, I treat my asthma like my mental illness. It's a chronic illness. I, I take medication. I do the preventive things that I need to do to keep from having an asthma attack. And I need to do the same to keep from having an episode of mental illness. So that is the challenge. And I think it's not a challenge that's overwhelming. We can do this 
And there are millions and millions of Americans who are successfully doing it every day, coping, uh, successfully um, leading very productive lives because they are treating their, their mental illness. And uh, I unfortunately think that n there aren't as many of them telling that story. And I think a big job for us is to uh, enhance our advocacy. So I'm a big believer that the only way we're going to be more successful in this effort is if we get more advocates because as a congressman, you know, I recognize that the most successful advocates get, you know, the most results uh, from their government. And that is why, frankly, we haven't been as successful in uh, more funding for research into neuroscience and, and how to better treat mental illness. And we haven't been more successful in getting these disparities and the discrimination towards mental health treatment resolved a lot sooner. And, and that was a direct result of the fact that people with a mental illness don't often vote and, they, and not very often do they advocate. So what you're left with is a, is a vacuum. And, and tragically, what gets left is the tragedy of not dr addressing this issue the way we need to address this issue. And, and it's an issue that we we're really seeing in the news lately from uh, the impacts of concussions in the NFL to student bullying to veterans suffering uh, from PTSD. Uh, mental health uh, is very prominent right now. And, and those... Uh, those those issues, those topics are all risk factors for suicide. Um, so have you thought about how suicide awareness and suicide advocacy plays into those kind of uh, preeminent hot button topics right now? Well, yes, again, I think that we have a terrific opportunity to change uh, not only our health care system, which we're in the process of doing, but while we do that, make sure mental health is as seamlessly part of every aspect of our health care system as, as we have um, seen in other areas of health. So uh, this is an opportunity for great progress, but we need advocacy. And, you know, with our returning American heroes suffering from what is known as the signature wound of the war, traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress, we need to uh, understand that our veterans are coming back and getting their coverage most often through their employer, not through the VA. So if their employer is not uh, making sure that their health benefits are adequate to dealing with mental health, then frankly, we will be letting down the very American heroes that have fought and saved many of us from seeing another 9-11 occur in our country. So I think this is a, a bipartisan issue. I think the urgency is terrific. As you mentioned, we're learning more and more about concussions and the, and the greater funding that we're getting from the NFL is, a, is, is welcome to how we can better understand and treat uh, the brain and, and uh, that, I think, is an effort that needs to continue with greater urgency. And, and the reason is, is because without that sense of urgency and commitment, these tragedies will only continue. And we cannot uh, permit that to, to go, f go forward any longer. And, and the sense of urgency uh, that you speak of uh, is, is kind of coming into our current state of play. I know that you played a major role in uh, winning the passage of the Mental Health Parity and Addition Equity Act, uh, getting it through Congress, um, and, and I know that that is taking effect uh, soon. So what will this law do? Well, you, you uh, ask the right question because uh, you ought to know that the administration has not released what's known as the final rule on mental health parity and addiction equity meaning they have not issued the regulatory guidance to insurance companies to define what accountability measures they will be held to in order to enforce the law that the Congress and the President signed. That's very crucial. So what the law said is whether you are inpatient or outpatient, whether you're in network or out of network, Pharmacy and emergency room services all need to be covered on par with parity 
with the rest of physical health. So in other words, if you're a stroke victim, if you have diabetes, um, if you have cancer, you need to see the same array of services through the primary care, secondary and tertiary care levels of care like you would in mental health and physical health have to be equal. And that's going to transform our mental health uh, delivery system because now we're finally going to have, you know, physical illnesses of the brain, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, you know, all of these things are going to require the same levels of, of treatment and sense of urgency that diabetes, asthma, cardiovascular disease currently enjoys in terms of reimbursement. And, and the prevention aspect that you talk about kind of speaks to what the Affordable Care Act is really striving to do to, to turn our, our health care system into a sick Sick, from a sick care system into a preventative care system. So uh, I'm going to ask you one final question uh, because APHA uh, has, has really hoped to, to become a leader uh, in addressing mental health disparities and, and mental health advocacy moving forward. Recently, uh, we teamed with, with uh, uh, former First Lady Rosalind Carter in combating mental health stigma uh, and its effect on, on the one quarter of Americans affected every year. Uh, if you could give APHA and other public health professionals advice, uh, what do we need to do to improve our nation's mental health as a whole and better prevent suicide? We need to make mental health as routine as any other part of health care and thereby reduce this sense that there's something different about it. We need to have a checkup from the neck up like we have a checkup for your cholesterol for your blood pressure, for any other issue that you have physically. This has got to be essential, as it is defined in the health care reform, essential health benefit. And we need to talk about it and, and really work on it, implementing it in a way that is um, as real as we would if it were cancer or any other of these serious illnesses that we treat without giving any second thought to it. That's the way we need to treat uh, mental health with the same sense of urgency because suicide is an example that these are fatal illnesses if they're not treated and uh, we wouldn't dream of denying people with cancer uh, treatment until they had stage four cancer but that's routinely what we do in mental health we wait until it becomes a crisis as opposed to as you said work to prevent it by implementing screening brief intervention referral and treatment so SBIRT will be covered under health care reform. We need to make sure people sign up for health care reform because, as you know, it um, has that pre-existing condition ex is no longer an exclusion to health insurance. That means more people will now be able to gain access and preventive medicine and screening can begin to be uh, really pushed forward. So I really think we need to galvanize people. This is a really important moment for them to become activated and make sure that mental health is, is included and vigorously covered in all of these health plans around the country. Well, Mr. Kennedy, thank you so much uh, for taking time out of your day to, to speak with us and, and APHA on, on uh, mental health and specifically uh, in celebration of uh, Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, uh, a very critical health observance, obviously. So well, thank would, you so much once again. I would just finally say, you know, I think you're, you're meeting in Boston in November, um, uh, one of your, your association or uh, public health officials are meeting. Uh, uh, and I would just uh, call your attention to the anniversary of my uncle's Community Mental Health Services Act, which was uh, signed into law in October of 1963. And if you want more information on that, just go to uh, thekennedyforum.org, www.thekennedyforum.org. Yeah, very timely. It's, the, the, I guess, the 50th anniversary of that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, Mr. Kennedy, thank you so much once again, and uh, we will definitely be uh, helping advocate uh, for mental health in the future with, right along with you. And, and you have the, the website for the psychiatry.org slash mental health um, so that uh, folks can get more information um, uh, from that uh, on this as well. Psychiatry.org slash mental health. All right. Well, sounds great. Thank you so much, Mr. Kennedy. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right, Bye now.
Hello, I'm Patrick Kennedy. We've all turned to our families for strength when facing life's biggest challenges. And when those challenges involve our health, family members often help us get the care we need. If someone in your family was suffering from heart disease or cancer, you'd want them to have access to the best possible care. Why should people showing signs of a mental illness be treated any differently? Unfortunately, only 38% of adults and less than 20% of children and teens with diagnosable mental health problems receive the treatment they need. The brain is part of the body too, and mental health patients should be treated the same as any other patient. If you think a loved one is struggling from a mental illness, don't let them suffer in silence. Talk to them. Let them know you want to help them get the treatment they need. Remember, mental illness is an issue of chemistry, not character. Learn how you can be an advocate for change at psychiatry.org slash mental health. A public service message from the American Psychiatric Association. Hello, I'm Patrick Kennedy. When our troops return from their tours of duty, the homecoming isn't always a happy one. Many of these brave men and women come home with invisible wounds from the psychological stress of deployment. Last year, more of our military members died by suicide than from combat. Anyone can experience stress after a traumatic event, and having this kind of reaction has nothing to do with personal weakness. That's why it's so important for veterans to hear from their families that seeking help for mental health is a sign of strength. And it's up to all of us, as members of the American family, to embrace our veterans so they stop suffering in silence. If you think a loved one is struggling from a mental illness, talk to them. Help them get the treatment they need. Remember, mental illness is an issue of chemistry, not character. Learn how you can be an advocate for change at psychiatry.org slash mental health. A public service message from the American Psychiatric Association.